Okay. So let's get started. I really appreciate everyone coming to this workshop. My name is Joyce Raimondo, and I am the education coordinator at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center. We're a national landmark in East Hampton. And today I am conducting this program remotely from my studio, which is right down the street. Now, um, we have many, many Zoom programs. You can go to pkhouse.org to get the full listing of virtual events. And also you could sign up for a tour to come in person in the spring. And um, let's get started. This particular workshop called Eye of the Beholder, What is Beauty? This is part of a series um, of workshops that explore vision and through the eyes of modern art. And um, this was inspired because I did have eye surgery and I just like to really be forthcoming about why I do these programs. I had cosmetic eye surgery. It didn't go as expected. It was very stressful for me. This was just recently. So as I was laying there, I was listening to a lot of tapes about healing and vision and um, I had some downtime. So that unhappy experience inspired this entire course. So I always like to say that sometimes physical challenges can be creative opportunities. So today we're gonna to explore beauty. So who can tell us by unmuting, uh, what does it mean when we say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder? What comes to mind when you hear that quote? Anyone? Uh, beauty is subjective uh, by the person seeing, looking at it. Very good. It's the idea of subjectivity. And the quote was actually coined by Margaret Hungerford in the 1800s, but it can also be credited to Plato and many other uh, writers and philosophers like Shakespeare and people all over the world say this in various ways. It's the idea, exactly as you said, the perception of beauty is subjective. What one person finds beautiful, another may not. And this dovetails very well with modern art because the whole gist of modern art is that art becomes very subjective, both about the artist's perception as well as the viewer's perception. So I'm gonna show you some um, images and we're gonna explore this theme through the eyes of modern art. I'm gonna ask you for your opinion about things from time to time. This is not a scholarly lecture. This is informal, it's conversational. And then we're gonna leave time for you to do your own artworks. Um, now, the subject of beauty obviously is vast, right? There's beauty in aesthetics, there's beauty in nature, there's beauty in human beings. Most of today's talk is going to focus on female beauty because that's a huge subject in modern art, okay? But let's first get started with Pollock and Krasner. Okay, so let's take a look at Pollock and Krasner and how their art challenged our notion of beauty. So here's a painting by Jackson Pollock and um, Marcel Duchamp says, a work of, he's also a noted artist, he says, a work of art is completed by the viewer. Now, what does that mean? When we look at a work of art, it's our perception and our experience and our interpretation and our individuality that gives meaning to what we're looking at. In modern art, there's not one way of looking at a painting. It doesn't have a specific message. Just gonna... Okay, so in the 19th, 40s and 50s, Pollock and the other abstract expressionists, they forge actually a new language of art. And Pollock in particular is using sticks, dripping paint from sticks, not using art paint, using house paint, puts the painting on the floor, works from all four sides. There's no up, there's no down, and there's no recognizable image in the painting. It's 100% abstract. And what makes abstract expressionism so unique is that it's physical. It's like he's releasing his energy. He's an action painter, he's moving and his movement is captured in the final result. Now, 
this is a key idea in abstract art, not all abstract art, but this type of abstract art and some art that came before it, like Kandinsky, Hilda, Hilmoff, Klimt, Mondrian. It's the idea that where is beauty? Does beauty exist in the physical object that you're looking at, at the recognizable thing? So you see a tree and you say, oh, that's beautiful. You see a vase and with light and flowers. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, these modern artists, these abstract artists say, no, we're not gonna paint objects. We're not gonna paint recognizable things that we see. Beauty comes from within. Now, that's not a quote from Jackson Pollock exactly. It's a general concept. It's the idea of going within and painting your dreams, your subconscious, your imagination, your energy, painting things that you actually can't see with the human eye, okay? We're painting forces, you might say, right? And I give other talks where we go into detail about this. So Pollock is so vulnerable in his approach. Well, let me just, sorry. He asks Lee, not is this a good painting? He says, Lee, is this a painting? That's how far out on the edge he was in terms of exploring new ideas in art, exploring, you, you can't really in a sense separate painting from aesthetics entirely, right? Some art of course is designed to provoke pleasure and beauty and art, many, you know, all art has different intentions. So when Pollock makes his drip paintings, and this is an example, he gets mixed reviews. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So one critic says an energetic adventure for the eyes. Somebody else says an elaborate if meaningless table of cordage and smears. Someone else says tremendous emotive energy. And someone else says absolute lack of harmony. Okay, so this is where we're talking about subjectivity. Also, when you, the viewer, look at the painting, we're all gonna see different things, not just in terms of beauty, but just in terms of finding meaning. Some people might say it's chaotic. Someone else says, oh, it's like a dance. It's so rhythmic, it's so pleasant, so energetic, right? So we're all seeing differently. Now, Lee Krasner is Jackson Pollock's wife. And um, can someone read that quote? Because my Zoom screen is blocking it. Who wants to be a good volunteer and read that quote? Anyone? We get used to a certain kind of color of form or format and it's acceptable. And to puncture that is sticking your neck out a bit. And pretty soon that's very acceptable, Lee Krasner. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So. If you don't mind, you don't have to answer the question, obviously, but since you're already unmuted, what is she getting at here in terms of we're talking about beauty today? What does this quote mean to you? Anything come to mind? Yeah, it reminds me of um, fashion, actually, where you see something and you think it's hideous and then about a year later you're wearing it. You, you get used to it and it becomes the norm. Yes, absolutely. Music too, right? Yeah, and yeah. This happens a lot of times, these artists who are on the cutting edge and they're avant-garde and they're challenging and it's so mm. unaccepted in its own time. And then not only does it become accepted, it often becomes a huge commercial success. It influences the market as well, yeah. right? So... It, these ideas, we'll just leave it at that, just something you know to take note of, and we're gonna explore these ideas further. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what I did here is I grouped, I, I created some themes. These themes are not hard and fast themes because all the art I'm gonna show you is interrelated. But I, I came up with a theme of beauty through the lens of love and desire. Uh, you could also, this also overlaps with the idea of the muse, the, the what you find inspirational as an artist, right? But clearly when we see things through a lens of love, we're gonna see, see it very subjectively. Or if we see a person or an object as an object of desire, 
right? That's going to affect our idea of beauty. So, um, so here we have Matisse and Bernard, and these are very good examples of the male gaze. Now, the male gaze is originally a term that's coined in the 70s, speaking about film. And it's the idea that when you, we watch a movie, because these movies were written and directed primarily by heterosexual men, when we're seeing images of women, and the way they're presented, whose view are we seeing the images through? We're seeing it through the view of a male heterosexual, usually white, right? So we're getting a very biased idea actually of what beauty is, right? And um, we're also sometimes, these images have actually aspects of voyeurism in them, often in painting like this one by Bernard or many, many images by Degas and many, many other artists. It's sometimes like we're looking at the female and she doesn't really know, she's unaware that she's being seen, right? The male gaze. Now, how is this problematic? Any thoughts on that? Either if you think about films or art. How is it problematic if it's seen through the eyes of the heterosexual male, the image of the female? Any ideas? Well, for one thing, it's a very narrow view, isn't it? It's a very narrow perspective, right? And for another thing, women, when they're watching these films or seeing these images are really being taught in a sense, what's desirable, right? What's the ideal beauty? How should I behave? But we're not seeing the story from a woman's point of view, are we? We're seeing ourselves through the eyes of a male. So it's male dominated. And this is a very vast topic. Um, and often, of course, the women might be sexualized or objectified. So Pablo Picasso is a great example of, he's doing his portraits of lovers. This is his mistress, Marie Therese. She's 20 years his, his, um, younger than him. But at any rate, he does many portraits of her and he projects his own subjective feeling towards her into the portrait. So he's not painting a likeness of Marie Therese. We would not recognize her if she was walking down the street. He's, he's projecting his subjective view of how he feels about her and perhaps also how she feels. So let's have some fun with this one. What do you think, how would you describe this person? What, th what thoughts come to mind? There's no right or wrong. Anyone wanna unmute and tell us? Does she look angry? Does she look sad? Does she look something else? Any thoughts? There are two sides to her personality. And what do you mean by that? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, two sides. Two sides like what? Yeah, just um, the face and the way the body is um, uh, in half-ish and the necklace has a... Uh, two different sides to it as well, and the arms two different, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, often the face is a cubist face, as is the body. So he's showing more than one viewpoint. And this yeah. in and of itself shows how artists challenge our notions of beauty. Instead of modeling the face, right, and drawing it only from one view, Picasso is actually challenging our way of looking at art or looking at a painting by painting in a cubist style. And at the time, of course, this is revolutionary, but he says it's more truthful not to paint exactly a likeness of someone, but to paint how he feels towards the person. Now, if you so, look, yes. I, I was gonna say, she seems very passive. 
um, like she's the, not so much the dream, but also the dreamer. Um, and that it, it, there's just, you know, pleasantness um, about her. Mm -hmm. What makes it look pleasant? Anything in particular about the, the, the colors, any, the pose, anything? I was mainly focused on the um, the hands and the 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 little small smile, you know, not a just a little hint of a smile. Mm -hmm. Anyone agree or disagree? I agree. I think there's no tension in it. She's um, almost boneless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you look at all these curvy lines, right? and the pale colors of her skin and her, her blouse, right? It's very easy to look at. There's nothing sharp, there's nothing angular. And then we have this very, the red is very sensual, right? So there's a contrast there. Now, what's interesting with Picasso is when you see these portraits of Marie Therese or his other lovers, you, you're going to see a lot of variety from time, day to day or time to time. So, for example, these are also portraits of Marie Therese, completely different. Okay. So, I love this as an example. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. We all know this in all relationships, right? It could be a lover, it could be your mother. One day you look at the person and you go, oh, they're wonderful. And, you know, and then the next day, you're like, oh, this person, I can't stand them. So that, of course, would, or, oh, my gosh, they're so depressed, stressing me out. So all of these things are going to affect the way you portray them, right, in an abstract sense. Does that make sense? So I love this one. This is Gaston Lachaise. And you could see his sculpture. One of them is at the Museum of Modern Art in the Courtyard. So here is his wife, his love of his life, right? Isabel um, Dutton Nagel. And if you look at her body type, it's somewhat average, right? It's, it's if you look at her legs and, you know, this, it's kind of average. Um, and then what he does is when he sculpts her or sculpts these women inspired by her, what do you notice about the sculpture on the left? I mean, the right, how is it different? Anybody notice anything? More muscular, more sensual. Yeah, it's more sensual. Look at the legs, Joyce. Look at the thighs are huge, right? Yeah. Here's yeah. another one. This one's more obvious. And I just, I love this. It's like, if you saw this sculpture, you would imagine this big buxom woman. And in fact, she was petite, but he's seeing her through his eyes, through his lens of desire, right? Here's another one, okay? So when with modern, I mean, all art this would be true of, but in particular in modern art, what happens is the distortion becomes even exaggerated. And he eliminates all essential details on this one to emphasize, right, her voluptuousness and her pose. I don't know, what do you make of that pose? Her arms outstretched like that, anything? What does that gesture make you think of? I have no idea what the answer is. You say, come and get it. <laughs> she she yeah. seems accepting. To me, uh -huh. she seems accepting. Like uh, she's open to anything. Actually, yeah. it's very spiritual to me. It reminds me of Virgin Mary holding Christ, only Christ is not there. Yeah, me too. In fact, it actually, her arms also remind me of Christ in terms of a lot of times he's pictured with his arms outstretched, right? like with children around him and things like yes, that. Yes. Yeah. And that's why all of, we're looking at all these images through the lens of beauty today, but these can be, you know, very complex. These can all be seen in different ways. So this is Eunice Golden. She's an East Hampton artist and she was a feminist artist. So what do feminists do? They turn this male gaze around. 
So they say, well, we as women, and this is mostly in the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, we want to explore how we see our sexuality. We want to express how we feel. We want to show ourselves the way we see ourselves. But most of the feminist artists are still dealing with their own female body. Eunice, I love because she is so unique in that she is expressing her desire for the male, for her male partner. And she does many, many male nudes and you might call it the female gaze. And it completely is revolutionary in terms of art. If you go to a museum, you're gonna see very few male nudes and you're gonna see very few works that explore women's sexuality from and desire from the point of view of the woman. Does that make sense? Because we're not supposed to be that way. We're not supposed to have those feelings. Well, especially back then, right? This is like Eunice, she actually came of age, um, I think she was born in like 1927 or something like that, I can't remember. So she really came of age at that time when it was very restrictive, where women had a very defined role as a housewife and a mother and a housekeeper, right? And then she broke away from that role and she explored her life as an artist. She created a new life for herself outside of the confines of that restricted role. Um, so this is by Robert Maplethorpe. He's pictured in the photo, the man on the right. And what's going on here? Like literally, what do you see in this picture? What's going on? Two men are hugging. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah who can describe the hug or something else that you notice. It looks like they're grieving or they're upset about something, the way they're holding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, well, the contrast of their skin, sorry. Yeah, one is black, dark skin, <sighs> the other one is white. Mm -hmm. this black is and the white was not uh, acceptable either. Yeah, so he's challenging the status quo in many ways. The status quo is what's considered the norm, what's accepted. This is 1982. This is the, the start of the AIDS crisis, right? Especially in New York City, where so many young men in New York City were dying. And it was largely ignored because it was a gay, gay disease, they called it, right? And at that time, homosexuality was still, a lot, a lot of people was still closeted. It wasn't too far back that homosexuality had been illegal. I don't remember the exact date that it became legal. Um, but here, Robert Maplethorpe is showing this loving embrace, right, between two men, right, two different races. Perhaps they are grieving, perhaps they're just consoling each other. It's hard to tell, okay? So this is a different kind of beauty, isn't it? It's not through the male gaze of the heterosexual male. It's a different viewpoint. Does I that think it's interesting that their faces are not, like they're hidden. And what does that do in your opinion to the photo, the fact that the faces are hidden? Anything? I think it makes it more universal. Mm-hmm. It could be anyone's face. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's very relatable, isn't it? Right? It's very, it's very universal. It's specific and universal at the same time. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the media and beauty and we're gonna explore some pop artists, okay? So pop artists are, are working off of popular culture. And at that time, there was no internet, there was no social media. So it was advertisements, television, magazines, uh, newspapers, and things like that, movies. So Roy Lichtenstein, what he would do is he would actually, at times, take an ad and then use that as inspiration for his paintings. But if you notice, if you saw this in real life, the skin has a little texture on it. 
And he would mimic what was called bende dots at the time. That's how they printed in newspapers. And he would run the paint like through a screen to get these little dots. So it would actually mimic the idea of being printed, even though it's actually a painting and it's quite large. You can see it at the Museum of Modern Art. So what ideal of beauty, what is he speaking to in terms of beauty in this picture? Any thoughts on that? To me, it's movie star beauty, the, the movie stars of the 40s and the 50s. And what makes you say that? Um, I, I, the whole presentation, I guess the bathing suit, that she's in a bathing suit, the, her shape, the red lipstick, the, the kind of wavy hair. Mm -hmm. The eyeliner. The eye, right. 1961, right? <laughs> And the waistline. I would yes. say, I would say it's very reductionist. He doesn't have any extra lines. He does minimal lines. Very good, Shelly. Yes. He's playing also off the idea. It's almost cartoon-like, right? Yes. Because it's like printed. And this is just such a good contrast to Jackson Pollock and the abstract expressionist. It's actually a reaction against expressionism. Expressionism abstract expressionism is the 40s and 50s in in New York these artists 1961 the pop artist is saying no 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 you know what art art doesn't come from within our major influences are actually the media and pop culture and sometimes the pop artists they neither they're not exactly criticizing pop culture and actually sometimes they're celebrating it and you can interpret it however you want. But like in this one, you cannot see the artist mark. It's the exact opposite of Jackson Pollock. You don't see the movement of the artist, the hand. It mimics this mechanical kind of reproduction. So here is the ad that I believe was in the yellow pages that Roy Lichtenstein was actually um, drawing inspiration from for Girl with a Ball. Okay. So Andy Warhol, of course, is one of the most celebrated pop artists. He himself, pictured on the bottom left, he himself, his image becomes an icon of celebrity. So he would um, print, make prints of these celebrities, and he became very wealthy also with commissions. And um, Andy Warhol was unique in that he wasn't doing the art like as a lone artist in a studio painting. He had a whole, he called it the factory. And he had all sorts of people collaborating with him to create these prints. He wasn't the lone artist with a paintbrush. But my question is how does celebrity define our idea of beauty? Any thoughts on that? Have you ever been influenced by a celebrity and changed the way you look? No one? It's interesting he has a Barbie doll there, that that was a young girl's idea of beauty, even though it was absolutely not like a woman's body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she, it becomes an image that's kind of etched in every girl's mind, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you should be emulating yourself, like, you know, really super skinny, you know, narrow, narrow waist, like a big bosom, you know, mm -hmm. long, sexy hair, you know, so that's one image. Mm -hmm. well, who is the woman on the right? With the long hair. With the long hair. The long red, uh, yellow hair beside Marilyn Monroe. Uh, I think that, is that Madonna maybe? I'm not sure. It's Madonna. I think it's Madonna. Madonna. Yeah, Madonna. Okay, that would be it. Yeah. Now, if you think about any of these celebrities, obviously they, they inform fashion. I mean, like Jackie O, right? And Madonna, if you were in the 80s, every girl was running out to get her outfits, right? The All of those crazy things she would wear. Um, so, of course, the idea of celebrity, it was very narrow during the 1960s. The, the celebrities that were shown, it was mostly white people, right? And it was only during the 60s that black people started to appear on television, right? Like with that show, Julia. So this was a very narrow idea of what beauty is. 
right? So how is Andy Warhol challenging our, our, our idea of what art is? How is this different than what you think of when you think of art before that? Anything? It was the, woman who, the woman with the green face looks almost like a negative. Mm -hmm. You know, like it would be printing a leg negative. So he's showing, you know, how, how common everything is that everybody is trying to do the same thing. Yeah, and Andy Warhol had his famous quote, everyone's going to have their 15 minutes of fame. Right. And it kind of came true today, right? Everybody can post and be famous. Um, anybody else? Well, for one thing, he's taking kind of low art and making it high art. He's taking ordinary um, images from magazines and newspapers and Campbell's soup cans, and he's elevating it to high art, to fine art, right? And he's also, as I said, he's not necessarily using the artist's hand. He's using mechanical processes to reproduce these images, right? So in that way, it's also very, very revolutionary. And it's not very emotional in terms of his inner feelings. It's not very personal, right? It's about a popular image, not his deep inner feelings. Are these screen prints? Yes, these are screen prints. So all there are like, um, this is Shelley, about eight different parts to each uh, portrait and you need different screens for the face, for the hair, and it's all interchangeable, the lips, the tongue. Mm -hmm. It's uh, really very clever to change yeah. all those parts and, and colors. Yeah, and this is a lot of fun to do. You could do it in painting where you take the same image and you change the colors if you want. You could do it with, you know, I used to do it with children and we would do color Xeroxes, color photocopies, and then paint them in different ways. And sometimes Andy Warhol does handmade paintings as well. There's one at the Museum of Modern Art where he screen prints Marilyn's face on top of a gold background. So he always had different, different techniques and also he, he's, he's really vast in terms of, he does movies and performance art and all sorts of things. Okay, so it's so interesting how, how our definition of beauty is defined in part by the media, but it also affects how we relate to each other, what our aspirations are. So here's Marilyn Monroe. This is clearly an example of, in film, the male gaze, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like literally the male gaze and she's objectified. She's the object of beauty. This is Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, okay? So how, does, how do these images impact our behavior? Anyone? It was a big boost to the diamond industry. <laughs> there sure was. All of a sudden, every woman wants a diamond when they get engaged. So it relates to the market, right? De Beers made De Beers much richer. <laughs> mm -hmm. It also shows that if you look like Marilyn, you'll get all the male attention that you want. <laughs> yeah, and so I mean, why do think about it. Why do women, why do so many women, or they used to, I don't know if they still do, go and bleach their hair blonde and pay all sorts of money to become blondes? Blondes, in quote, have more fun. Remember, well, do, they, blondes, do, do blondes have more fun? That was the ad line. Mm -hmm. oh, only her hairdresser knows for sure. <laughs> right, Shelly, yeah. And it worked very well. A lot of women go and used to bleach their hair blonde, right? Yeah. And even the idea of pink as a color, as a woman's color, right? Or toys for children, the girls are pink. That's all contrived because uh, prior to 1945, pink was actually a boy's color. Blue was for girls, believe it or not. That's all taught, that's all learned through the media, through images. It's mostly often driven by the market and it can also be driven by, um, you know, the power structure, right? that men want women to be a certain way. I, I also noticed watching a lot of movies, especially the early ones, the, the good woman or the, the, you know, the, the nice woman or, you know, it was blonde. And all, usually, usually it was the, you know, the, the dull, 
not as popular as the blonde or they were evil yeah the, i know like yeah, in, so I, I remember, like in snow white the witch is dark and uh well no in snow white had dark hair but often the witchy person has dark hair yeah and it's not attractive right and often the blonde <laughs> who is attractive is shown as dumb so these are all stereotypes but let we could go into this i'm sure we could have a cup glass of wine and discuss this for hours no i'm just kidding so um roy lichtenstein pop art again he he didn't this was not directly inspired to this advertisement but i pulled this up just to sort of show how these ads um really inform our idea not only of beauty but of love and what a relationship is right and what if we look a certain way we're going to get that love we're going to get that security and roy lichtenstein roy lichtenstein plays off of this kind of stereotypical imagery imagery excuse me in these cartoon like paintings okay and of course my question is how does all this even reflect impact how we look at ourselves when i look in the mirror how does how do all these popular notions of beauty affect how i feel when i look in the mirror any thoughts on that i fall short <laughs> Yeah, a lot of women have, you know, uh, especially young girls, when they're forming their identity, have a crisis in self-esteem, right? If they don't look exactly like that status quo image, right? And for women also, I can only speak for myself, but obviously it's a major theme. Aging can be painful when we're told we're supposed to look a certain way, right? It's a huge market. Beauty products are, you know, so-called anti-aging products, huge market. This one is by Andy Warhol, right? I don't know what he intended when he made this. It's called Before and After, right? Plastic Surgery United. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what is, what is beautiful? How do we learn what is beautiful? It often comes from the dominant culture, right? Now, uh, Willem de Kooning challenges this. He actually puts under this painting, he has like a picture of a pinup girl, and then he starts to paint on top of that. And this is what comes out. This is part of his Woman One series. And she's obviously, this woman is exactly the opposite of a pinup girl. It's exactly the opposite of the way a woman is typically shown. Here she's like fierce, she's big, she's masculine, she's angry, her eyes are bulging, she's actually ugly, right? So again, he's projecting his feelings of aggression, right? And also the woman is in the picture who's sort of ambiguous the sexuality a little bit is projecting back out to us. Her face looks like a skull. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this painting also, there's a lot of different imagery in here. She almost also looks like a warrior, right? Yeah. I was just thinking that, yeah, her breasts look like armor. Yeah. 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 So and then there's like this hint of, at the foot, there's like a hint of a high heel down there. Yeah. Right? Or, but then that you look at it again, it looks like a hoof. This is an example of abstract expressionism. De Kooning lived down the street from Pollock. Um, the difference is, of course, with de Kooning, he's one of the few abstract expressionists who did, still did figures in his work. He did the human figure and also abstract art. But it, like Pollock, it's very physical. You can see scraping and swooshing and blending. And this one I love, this is Robert Maplethorpe, 1980, who I showed you before, self-portrait. So how is he challenging stereotypical ideas of gender and beauty? Or stressing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makeup. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and his face is split in half by the lighting, by the shade. Yeah. And he's pretty. He looks pretty. So it's it's calling into question really what is beauty, what is masculinity, what is femininity, 
what does it mean to be a man or a woman? And today, of course, young, the younger generation is really pushing this even further in terms of, you know, coming up with new pronouns, he, she, and they, right? Or saying, using the term non-binary and the term much more fluid in its sexuality and not so rigid. Whereas in the 50s, as I'm sure if you were alive, which I was born in 1961, but I have a memory of the 50s from my parents. It was very rigid what a boy was supposed to be and what a girl was supposed to be. And this gets opened up in the 60s and it's reflected in art, okay? Of course, this was later, this was 1980, okay? And uh, this is a photographer, Quam Brothwaite, who is very important in Black is Beautiful. So what do we mean by the movement Black is Beautiful? Anyone? Now, in terms of race, right, um, as a Black person in this country, right, women, and they still are often, under a lot of pressure to conform to this white ideal, this white standard of beauty. And the hair is a big issue, the straightening of the hair, right? So black is beautiful says, no, 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 no. We don't have to straighten our hair. We can wear an Afro, we can wear our hair, we can celebrate our African roots, right? We don't have to conform to this narrow standard created by white, primarily white men, right? So it's a, there's a sense of freedom, but I love this. It really is the power of the image, right? If as a young girl, all you see are images of a Marilyn Monroe and you're African American or black, and that's all you see, there's no dolls that are black. There's no pictures of any, first off you feel invisible, but also it's going to affect the way you see yourselves and others. Right. There's that famous study where they gave uh, children, I think it was in the 1960s, they gave black children um, dolls, a white doll and a black doll, and they said, which one is more lovable? And the black children said the white doll, the majority of them. Where does that come from? Right? It comes from the media, it comes from the images that we see. So seeing your own beauty, we'll go through these a little quicker. There's only a few left because I do want to have time for you to do the project. But of course, Frida Kahlo is one of the most important artists in terms of taking this from the feminine viewpoint. It's a woman, she's a woman painting herself and painting all the intimate moments in her life. And what's so interesting about Frida Kahlo is she's not what you'd call in quotes a classic beauty, right? Her eyebrows grow together. Um, her father, when she was young, and I'm not saying this is right by any means, when she was about to marry Diego Rivera, he said, oh good, like marry my daughter because she's not that pretty. And this way, you know what, it, she'll be taken care of, right? Um, so she wasn't considered for that time, the standard beauty. But today her face is one of the most recognizable faces and printed on everything from pocketbooks to posters to makeup cases and, and so on. She's one of the most popular artists in the world. So here she has this image of herself and then she has the blank mirror there. If it, in real life, that would be a mirror and these would be side by side. So she's inviting you to see yourself as you're looking at her portrait as well, okay? And in her portrait, you see, not only does she show the eyebrows, but she actually makes herself almost look extra hairy, like a mustache. And it almost is like she's relating to the monkey and being in the wild, right? And she was unable to bear children. So she was very close with her animals um, who she had, like you might say, like a motherly instinct towards. And I invite you to go online and see many of the self-portraits that she did, where we're a witness to her pain because she was um, in a bus accident as an older teenager, and she had very serious um, injuries as a result of that. And I think she had like 44 
uh, serious surgeries throughout her lifetime. And she spent a lot of time in bed painting her own self-portrait looking up at a mirror. But this is one of my favorite Frida Kahlo paintings. It's called The Broken Column. So how do we see beauty through pain? Any thoughts on this? What do you see in this picture? I see her strength and, and determination and courage. How do you see that? Where do you see that? I think mainly her posture. And there's something in her expression, the eyes, the way the eyes are looking at me, kind of almost daring me. Um, Anyone else? Just reminding through all her pain and her spine disintegrating there. She said, To me, it's looking past what she's painted, like like the the I don't I don't know that that device that she has that's actually uh, helping her to be able to stand there like she is. And looking past that and into her and who she is, mm -hmm. I think that's what that's about. Because she was a very strong person. Mm -hmm. That bus accident was horrific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? I think she's suffering unbearable pain. And if you notice, there's a there are big nails in her all over, but around her heart, there's a super big nail sticking into her heart. And she's just an intense pain, but maybe the heart one is because of Diego's behavior, what he did to her too, mm -hmm. you know, so that she's suffering extra in her heart as well as all over her body. Yeah, we'll discuss that. We're going to do a program called Art Lovers, and we'll discuss her relationship with Diego Rivera in more depth. Anyone that's else? striking how big that nail is compared to all the other nails, which are painful enough to look at, you know. Yeah, I never noticed that. Mm -hmm. I just noticed it for the first time. It's, it's her left side and that's her heart. He's sticking a knife in her heart. Mm -hmm. And well, also, you know, it was hard for her. She was a, like an older teenager when this bus accident happened and she's in bed in a cast for like a year and she had a boyfriend. Well, what do you think happened? Of course he left her, right? And she makes a portrait for him at that time of like, it's almost like a Victorian European type portrait. And she tries to get him back. When I say, of course he left him, I mean, I don't think that's unexpected. You're a teenager. Most teenage boys wouldn't, you know, be so loyal to a girl who has to stay in bed. You know what I mean? I don't think that's surprising, but you can imagine how difficult that was for her, right? And then the suffering of the actual physical pain so, but what's amazing with Frida Kahlo is even though the column, so to speak, is broken, it is upright. She is standing strong. And also it's a picture of beauty. Look at her breasts and her body. She's a female beauty despite the pain, right? So she always, she was very bold in her sexuality, in her political views, in her art, in her strength, and in her joy of living. She lived life to the fullest. And you see this in her paintings. You see the pain, but you also see the joy and the sensuality and the beauty. She was a woman who loved beauty. Her home was filled with beautiful objects. So we can take so much inspiration from Frida. And also she was meticulous in the way she, you know, did her hair and her clothing and she celebrated her Mexican culture her traditional Mexican culture. And she was very particular about getting these fresh flowers, putting them in her hair, the way she set a table, all of these aspects of beauty appear in her paintings as well as her daily life. And she, you, can visit, you can visit the home in Mexico. But the idea of beauty, she certainly didn't subscribe. You know, she didn't you know, pull out the hairs on her mustache and she didn't care about the unibrow. So she you know, was saying, I'm sticking it to everybody the way I am and to get what everybody else thinks. That's exactly right, <laughs> Shelly. And she would go to these parties, you know, these high-end parties with Diego Rivera, who was one of the most important um, Mexican artists. And like, for example, when they came to the United States, right? It was the 40s, the 30s. I forget the exact year. I'm sometimes not good with dates. But anyway, 
um, you know, people were dressed in the standard fashion of the day and she would show up in traditional Mexican clothes. And so she really stood out, but she was really proud of her heritage and she wasn't gonna, she wasn't gonna conform to this very narrow idea of beauty. So she is a great inspiration in that sense. Well, the other thing about that painting is that this one it's the broken column. Yeah, and you see the broken column, but the nails have nothing to do with that. So it's like, it's not only that there's something broken, but it's pain or suffering or something else that's going on in addition mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there was a it's lot of, I mean, it's remarkable how this woman suffered so much physically as well as there was a lot of turbulence in her marriage, but she really did persevere through her art through it all. Sometimes she was even painting her cast, her physical body cast that she was wearing as she was in bed. Now, we'll go a little quicker on this one, and I invite you to revisit this online. This is self-portrait with cropped hair. She makes this after Diego Rivera cheats on her with her sister. He was a womanizer, he had affairs all along. But once, you know, with the sister, that was kind of the last straw. So they, they divorced and Frida Kahlo makes this self-portrait picturing herself sitting like a man in man's clothes. She literally in real life did chop off her hair. And on the top, she writes in Spanish with a rough translation. I used to have hair, now that I don't have hair, you don't love me anymore. So what does hair have to do with identity and beauty? Why wouldn't you love someone now I don't have hair anymore? Hair is tremendously involved with sexuality, tremendously. Mm -hmm. I mean, people wear wigs, you know, and all of that, you know, to have more beautiful hair. So hair is a very important part of sexuality. Mm -hmm. To cut and, it off is, and to wear men's clothes, you know, maybe she's bisexual. Maybe that's what she's showing here. Well, she was bisexual. So she's showing that. She said, well, you don't want me as a woman. Maybe you like me as a man. Mm -hmm. No, I think that Diego, I think her husband really liked her hair so much. I think he mentioned that. And so because he liked her hair so much, she felt that she was going to cut off the thing that she, he really loved. And, mm -hmm. and and this is the situation here. She says, well, you don't, you love my hair, my beautiful hair, I'm cutting it off. I mm -hmm. think that's the, the idea. Yeah. Anyone else? I was just thinking maybe the, the, the idea that hair defined, or she maybe felt that hair defined her beauty as well. Mm -hmm. Could be, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's the way again, how people see what beautiful is and what beauty is not. And mm -hmm. some people associate hair with beauty. Mm -hmm. so there you are. Yeah, uh, and identity. Uh, yeah. Well, it's identity. Right? It's identity. You yeah. have a certain hairstyle, it identifies you as a certain type of person, also. Uh, this is Shelly. I also like the um, attention to the drapery in the suit, which is the most realistic part of uh, this painting. She does have some rouge on, the rest of it is kind of surrealistic. And I wonder what those words say on top. Well, that says in Spanish something to the effect of, now I used to have hair, now that I don't have hair, you don't love me anymore. Oh, okay. And you're right, Shelly, she's telling a true story, a true event, but she's doing it in a fantasy kind of way with hair floating, right? And it doesn't even look, it doesn't look in perspective. It's almost like the hair is floating upright, right? So it's a true story told in a fantasy way. Now, we're not saying with all of our comments, this is what Frida Kahlo thought. The only way we could tell that is if we read her diary, right? But this is what we see when we look at it. And this is a loaded image. There's so much you can see, so much women especially, and men can relate to. If you've had a breakup, right? And you have... Now you might take on a different role. You might take on the role of the man if you were divorced. Uh, you know, you might be really mad and want to just say, I'm tired of looking a certain way. Let me chop off this hair. Whatever, it's very relatable. 1940, this is how long? 80 years, it's as relatable today as it was then. So this is interesting. Okay, now bear with me on this. And this is our last little segment here. Uh, 
I love Barbie dolls, but this is a little shocking that they make a doll of Frida Kahlo and what did they do? What'd they do to Frida? They lightened her skin. They made her super skinny and they twisted her eyebrows. Yes. <laughs> so this is a clear example of corporate, you know, ideology, right? Informing their ideal of what beauty is, right? Into the market. Any thoughts on this? One of the things that I think is that uh, children, when they get something like a doll that does have maybe what might somebody might consider an imperfection or maybe their one leg is longer than their other or whatever. I mean, and if you're a child that has some kind of handicap or whatever, or even if you're not, the child with the handicap can really relate to it. And the other child can also start to um, understand or possibly sympathize with somebody that has uh, the physically, they're not, you know, um, what you would um, be used to seeing. Yeah, of course, absolutely, right? Children, remember that quote, children learn what they live. Yes. Remember that from the 60s, children learn what they live. So I was reflecting as I was putting this talk together. So bear with me. I didn't know if I wanted to be so personal, but I'm going to share something with you. I was thinking, can a doll really impact how somebody thinks? Or is it just child's play? This is a little story. There's my Barbie doll on the left. And here's a book I wrote when I was seven years old. I have to say it's pretty well written, but I pulled this up from the basement. So this girl asked Susan, Susan, do you know why no one likes you? Um, well, said Rory, you just must go on a diet and get all new clothes and don't put curlers in your hair and let your bangs grow. Susan made a sigh. She knew it wouldn't be easy to go on a diet. Then Susan went home and weighed herself. The scale looked like this and the story goes on. She thought, oh, I am fat. I must go on a diet and lose 20 pounds. I did this when I was seven years old. Now, my parents were, did not pressure me at all to look a certain way or anything like that. No one ever told me I was fat. Where did I get this from? Right? Well, it's images like this. It's images like this on television, right? Every girl was stick thin. I wasn't fat, I was just not petite. And so now, this is my art as a, an adult, where sometimes I'll use the Barbie doll form and I play off on that using very fragile materials to question and challenge how these forms, how this, this so-called Barbie image, how it kind of restricts and confines a woman. And yet we're all so fragile. Okay. Any questions, thoughts? Thank you. I think that's very powerful that it's seven. One, I admire your, your creativity, um, but um, it takes us back to those moments when we were all young and vulnerable and trying to figure out the world and um, what, what the problem must be is I'm not that perfect mm -hmm. being that everyone seems to love. Mm -hmm. And of course, men have their own, their own images and their own issues to deal with. But typically in art, we do see the female image portrayed much more often than the man, the male, okay? So we have about 15 minutes and I would like to invite you to sketch or you could grab a magazine, you can do a collage um, and you can take this from one of the viewpoints. You can make a picture about the way you look at your own beauty. You can make a picture that challenges our idea of beauty you can make a picture through the lens of love of someone you love and see beauty or what do you think is true beauty okay so you could take it from any angle that you choose and then we'll do some sharing any questions so i'll show mine because i was having fun oh good carol you can see 
I wrote the word beauty and then I made all the letters sort of different. And Wait, then I was making yeah. mm -hmm. different kinds of faces. And then I was gonna color them in that they were, you know, all beautiful in their own way. I think that's adorable. And you know what, <laughs> if you go in for being playful, go all the way. <laughs> like I'm maybe, not an artist, so I just get to no, have fun. like go go really give some antennas, give some green hair. <laughs> you know, really think like a little kid with that. Like really, yes. silly. that's so good because I love that. That should be like in all the schools, right? Like a poster. <laughs> Here's what beauty looks like. Very good. Anyone? You know, I, yeah, I'd like to show Susan. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Um. Obviously. I, just outlining but it's the idea of I see you and just two people although they look like women I didn't want them to look particularly like a woman and a man but how locked up they are in one another um you know just actually seeing one another for who they are and and loving one another and I thought maybe if I actually painted it I probably would make their dress very very different that's really good. I mean, good being, it's just so, I love the way you communicated that in such a simple, beautiful way. That's great. Mm -hmm. All okay. of you are amazing. These Thank are like, you know, I used to do in the school, the anti-bully programs. These are like anti-bully posters. <laughs> it, it's a great lesson. It really was. I enjoyed it very much, very much. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, you know, I hope it makes you want to learn more. Obviously, this is a broad and deep topic. This is a vast topic. Vast. So I'll share. I hope I, I hope I did it justice. Who just said that, Donna? Yeah, I, I will share. I will share, even though I haven't shown my face the whole time. OK, uh, let's, here we go. Wait. Spotlight you. Yeah. Okay, Donna, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Here I am. Does and it look like me? And it says, be yourself. I love you. There you go. All women, you ladies are, this is so good. Yeah. You're all inspiring me. You're the best, all of you. Thank you very well, much. I really no, enjoyed it. I, you know what? I love it. I love the way you got the, the roundness of the face and the the glasses and just very simple and beautiful. Thank you. No, again, this these are all like, it's turning into the kind of like anti-bully posters. Anybody else? Anyone who took a different approach who wants to share? Hi. Joyce, you want to turn your camera on? I was just like this just did little silly different hair. This is just a paper outfit. Hold it still. Oh, so you did different hairstyles? Yeah, I'm tired, so I just did little things. <laughs> I love that. And, and where's me? I lost me. Oh, there's me over here. What? I absolutely love that. That is so playful. That's yeah. a great idea. Thank you. you know, Marlo Thomas, who was that girl, I don't know if you remember her, where you yes. are. And she <laughs> did that wonderful true. series. It was a feminist series and it was, it, she was, I love Marlo Thomas. And it just reminded me, her book series was called Free to Be You and Me. Oh, really? Free to Be You and Me, yeah. Marlo Thomas. Yeah, yeah I, I actually remember that. It's a, there's a land that I see <laughs> where the children are free. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It, it was also um, a record album that I used to play for my children when they were going to sleep. Yeah, and at the time it was really new and radical, this idea, you know, it was the women's women's movement. It still is the women's movement. Um, hopefully the women's movement will just keep evolving, right? It's interesting, I don't know if, if you're, you're familiar, you know, with Rihanna, the singer, and she made this lingerie company where she market 
she markets the lingerie to all different body types. And she does these amazing videos where she does have women of all different body types, women of color also, people who are um, have physical challenges. And her company surpassed Victoria's Secret. So it's really interesting, the, these changing notions of beauty, right? And what people really want. And if you're in New York, um, I hope you get outside and enjoy this lovely day because I think the storm is coming on the weekend. <laughs> so take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much.